knowing the stock market is uh, it's very similar to knowing an alcoholic. It's like it treats you really bad, and then the next day it wakes up and it acts like nothing ever happened, right? That's a stock market for you. Look at this here today. $41,000 up on Meta, $7,600 up on PayPal, almost $10,000 up on Elf on a Shelf. Palantir's up $15,000. NVIDIA's up 5 plus percent here today, right? And this comes after yesterday. Very bad day in the market, and today was even a better day than it was a bad day yesterday for me. Absolutely incredible, right? Now, I woke up to the headline I did not want to see because usually the day after we go through some sort of epic event in the market, we get like the results of what actually transpired in that particular day. And I got the headline I didn't want to get. JP Morgan says institutions bought the dip while retail panic sold aggressively. Retail sold about a billion dollars worth of stocks, a 2.5, a negative 2.5 standard deviation below the 12 month average. Institutions bought plus $14 billion, plus 2.9 standard deviation above the 12 month average. So there we were in a situation yesterday where the VIX spikes high, stocks are crashing all over the place. And um, unfortunately, time and time again, the same exact story plays out. And I, every time I think like, this is it, like it's not gonna play out this way. Like retail's, like they're smart enough to know to buy in these situations and not sell when all their stocks are crashing. No, it happens again and again and again. I posted this inside my private stock group. I said, everyone, this is the difference between well-trained in the market versus not. Well-trained retail investors know when stocks are crashing to buy. They know when the VIX is spiking out of control to buy. If the market crashes more, sweet. We buy more in future weeks and months. Non-trained retail sees a market crashing and they sell for losses. They don't buy in a crashing market. They quote, stay on the sidelines until the coast is clear, which is a fancy way of saying when the market's back to new all time highs and hype and excitement's back in the market, right? Cheers to all who were buying uh, the dip and never tripping, right? Absolutely incredible. And I'll put it to you like this. Uh, I tried to find a picture of myself when I was in the seventh grade, but I couldn't. So I found this picture of me when I was a little kid, okay? When I was in the seventh grade, I tried out for the middle school basketball team, and I thought I was going to make the team. I never trained basketball. I didn't, my, my dad never trained me for that, and I never knew anybody that trained me for that. I never practiced basketball or anything. I thought I was just going to go to my middle school, and like I was going to you know, make it through, and I was going to make the team, right? The 13-man roster or whatever, right? 13-boy roster. Well, I got cut on the very first round of cuts. And I remember sitting there, like, you know, they're talking to us afterward, you cut, hey, you know, practice harder. And I remember just crying my eyes out and I had to ride my bike home and whatnot. And uh, now I look back and I'm like, I shouldn't have been crying because I was not even trained, right? And that example I give you, that's for a very simple thing of playing basketball. You're shooting a, a, a ball through a hoop, right? And in the market all the time, people think they can get away with not properly training in the market, and then they have to learn the hard way, and then they cry their eyes out. And this is a perfect example, and it happens every single time. Every single time. There's a big difference between people that are trained well in the market and then their results over the coming years versus people that aren't trained. And it's, it's, I see it time and time again, and it never fails. That's the sad part. It never fails, okay? So we got a lot to discuss in today's video. I sold out of a ton of my Chipotle put options yesterday. I'll show you screenshots of that, and I'll tell you kind of the details why I went ahead and did that yesterday specifically. Why not wait till today or the next day, something like that, right? Then we're going to go ahead and talk about Fubo's earnings. Fubo's earnings came out this morning. They had about 26% year-over-year revenue growth, 24% year-over-year subscriber growth. So we'll speak about Fubo, what the opportunity or not opportunity is there. Celsius came, also came out with earnings this morning. This stock is now down 57%. This was a very discouraging day for a lot of bulls in regards to Celsius. And the reason being is this stock was just in a massive downtrend. We got a huge update in the market here today. A lot of people looked at the numbers and they beat on you know pretty much everything they were supposed to beat on, and yet the stock still went down. Okay, so we'll dive into the Celsius numbers. We'll talk about if there's opportunity in Celsius stock in this video, and then we're going to discuss Palantir stock. A double digit move, right? The stock closed around 26.50 here today, right? Where's the stock going from here? In my personal opinion, now this is fascinating because remember where it closed at around 26.50. If you watch my video, which no one freaking watched, it was a 10 of 10. So sad. Right, my Palantir video right before earnings came out, I posted that like what, 24 hours before the earnings came out, right? What did I tell you my expectations were for the stock right after earnings? I said, it's likely gonna be between 25 and 28. What's the midpoint of 25 and 28? 26.50, where'd the stock close today? 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So we'll, we'll dive into where Palantir is going from here. Appreciate everybody joining me as always. Thank you so much for being here. We have uh, a new 2,400 subscribers here recently. So I appreciate you all joining me. New all time high in the, the history of the channel. Uh, speaking about training, I got a free training for you guys. That's going to be the pinned comment today. Make sure you access that before you leave today's video. Okay. Either, either pause the video right now, get, get that free access, or at the end of the video, make sure you get the free access to them. Seven things to do when stocks are crashing. That goes into detail on some very important things that you need to be doing when stocks are crashing, okay? And a little, little free training for you out there, okay? We'll email that over to you. So Chipotle put options. I decided to cash a bunch of these yesterday. So I cashed all 50 contracts of this particular one. And these ones were expiring in January of 2025. So January 17th, 2025. It looks kind of weird here, right? Um, and these were $44 puts. And we've gotten a really good return on these ones. So I looked at this and, and I said, let me cash out of these. And then we have the public account ones, which I had 20 contracts as of yesterday, right? And these ones recently have done very well as well. These were $63 puts expiring March 21st, 2025. And I went ahead today, or excuse me, not today, yesterday, and I went ahead and cashed out of 10 of those particular contracts. And so why did I do that yesterday? Why not wait? You know, obviously yesterday the market was so bad. The sentiment was so bad. Like, why not just wait and kind of say, oh, maybe it'll get even worse, those sorts of things. There's a few reasons why I went ahead and cashed, you know, heavily most of those Chipotle puts I have. I have a few left, but I sold the majority yesterday. few reasons, okay? First is the VIX went to the moon yesterday, literally, okay? The VIX went 50 plus. I believe it technically went 60 plus on the trading view chart. It shows, it'll, you know, like oh, going up to 55 or so, but I believe it went over 60 yesterday for a short amount of time. The bottom line is anytime the VIX spikes over 30, you're in insane territory for the VIX. If you go 50 plus, you're in rare company. That's like great financial crisis. That's like, you know, I mean, I can't how many times the Rona crash, like it's not very often you ever see the VIX go 50 plus. It's insane, okay? And so whenever the VIX goes 50 plus, always keep in mind, you should be buying stocks. If you see a VIX at 50 plus, you should be buying stocks. That's like a telltale sign of like, today's probably a pretty good day to buy some stocks out there. The second thing is when the VIX goes 50 plus, you should be cashing hedges. Like that's a time of volatility. That's a time that stocks are probably getting hammered. And it usually makes a lot of sense to cash out some hedges in regards to this. So if you have some put options out there in the market, it's, it's a very good time to cash some, right? Wall Street's fear gauge, the VIX, hit the highest level since the Rona crash of 2020 yesterday. That's extraordinary, right? That does not happen very often. Now, second reason is around the put-to-call ratio, okay, PCE. Put-to-call ratio, very, very important. So put-to-call ratio went to 1.05 yesterday. People were loading up on puts across the board. And the reason being is everybody was very off sides. Not enough people had been hedging. Not enough people had been buying put options, right? And so all of a sudden you get the crazy volatility yesterday. You already had volatility starting to spike up last week, right? But then you had just Monday was pure craziness, right? And so next thing you know, everybody's buying everything and get their hands on put option wise, okay? So guess what? Even though Chipotle stock didn't actually go down that much yesterday, the premiums went up substantially on Chipotle put options yesterday, and it went up uh, for all other stocks as well. So I kind of looked at that and I said, okay, people are willing to pay a lot even though the stock's not down that much. Let me go ahead and cash a lot of these for some very nice profits on those ones, right? And so that's, that's why I ended up doing it yesterday. If it wasn't for the fact that the VIX had spiked the way it was, I'd probably be holding those still. And if it wasn't for the fact that people were loading up on puts, I probably would be holding it still, right? Now, the next question is, where do I go from here for my next, uh, you know, hedge in the market? So a stock I'm looking at to potentially bet against and hedge against here is this one. It's FICO. Now, I'm not quite ready yet to hedge against this one because I've got to find a fundamental flaw in FICO. And I don't know if I've found it yet. The bottom line is with FICO, the growth is about to decelerate likely, okay? So this year, analysts have the company, we're looking at 1000xstocks.com, analysts have the company growing about 17% revenues, and then that's supposed to decelerate to 12% next year. Investors don't like it when you have a major deceleration in revenue. And the, the valuation's insane. We're at a 65 forward P. Even if you look at a two-year forward P, you're at about a 50 for FICO. And we all know FICO is a famous, obviously, credit rating agency, right? And they kind of have a monopoly. Now, one of my thoughts is, is maybe the government gets involved. We know the government's going after anybody that kind of is seen as a monopoly and keeps kind of raising price. FICO could fit that category as kind of a monopoly-type business model. So I don't know. We'll see. 
We'll see. We'll see. My hope is they announce like a stock split here in the short term. The stock has like a blow off top. And then maybe I come in, hedge against it toward the end of this year. And then maybe I have a play there from like a recession standpoint. If we got a recession and loan volumes going down and the amount of credit you know, running needs to go down, or maybe have a play on maybe the government getting involved here. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. It's one I'm potentially looking at. I'll get a lot more interested if they do a spl stock split and uh, the, the thing has a blow off top. But we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Fubo TV. So they moved in the right direction in regards to their earnings here. Okay. So where's the stock going? All those sorts of things. Let's discuss this. So they did, in terms of subscription revenue, 362 mil. That's versus 288 mil. Advertising revenue went to 26.2 mil versus 23 mil. Other uh, revenue came in at $1.7 million versus $671 million. So we're all moving in the right direction across the board here. Total revenues went to 390 mil versus 312 mil at the same time last year. Great. Subscriber related expenses was up to 326 mil, but that didn't go up nearly as much as revenue was up, which is good. Broadcasting and transmission actually dropped for the company year over year. And this is some cost saving measure, measures are doing that went down to about $15 million versus 18 million sales and marketing 35 mil versus 33 mil. So it was up a little bit year over year technology and development went to 19.3 mil versus 17.7 .7 mil general administrative GNA $20 million versus 15. That was kind of a, you know, one line item I looked at there was a little high in my opinion. Depreciation and amortization, it is what it is. Total operating expenses came in at 426 mil versus 365. Operating loss got brought down to $35 million from $52 million in this same quarter last year, which is what you need to see with Fubo. Fubo, we got to continue to bring down the losses, bring down the losses, bring down the losses until we flip over to profitable side. And then this company can become you know, standing on their own two feet. You don't have to worry about any more shareholder dilution. You don't have to worry about bankruptcy. And the whole fundamentals of the company change. So we continue to move in the right direction, right? Now, in terms of other income expense, that other expense item was up to about 5.5 mil from 3.4 mil. They had a gain on extinguishment of debt. That's kind of could be seen as more of a one-off. So that helped $12 million there roughly. So that brought the loss from continuing operations before income taxes. And obviously when you're losing money, you don't get taxed, right? Um, um, that, or if you do, it's very minuscule. That brought the loss down about $25 million from $54 million. So everything with Fubo moving in the right direction, it's what we need to see, okay? Now, additionally, this is very important. This might be the most important thing of everything, okay? So net cash used in operating activities in second quarter 2024 was 31, almost 32 mil. That's a $39.2 million improvement compared to 2Q 2023. So they're burning through cash at much less of a rate, much less of a rate versus at this point last year. That's phenomenal. Additionally here, they ended the quarter with $161 million in cash and cash equivalents and restricted cash on hand. Following the debt repurchase transaction described above, they now have no debt maturing in 2024 or 2025. That's big. That's big because we're talking about this company got to continue to bring down these losses over this next few quarters and then hopefully flip to profitability in 2025, right? And so the fact that we don't have to worry about debt maturing over this time period we're going through is monumental, absolutely monumental, okay? Now, additionally, the company has $144 million maturing in 2026 and $177 million maturing in 2029. So that's way down the road. Now, by the time we get to 2026, the Fed's going to likely have lowered rates substantially, so they're likely to be able to roll over that debt at much lower interest rates. So that's phenomenal. So here we are in a good situation where the Fed's getting ready to start lowering interest rates, and we have no debt maturing over this time period when the Fed's going to start lowering, lowering, lowering. So this is, this is great news, great news. Now, my view on is Fubo going bankrupt? What are the odds they put on this? It's getting lower and lower and lower as we go on here. This is phenomenal. I would say there's about a 10% probability the company goes bankrupt before 2026. Very low probability. I'd say there's about a 10% probability the company goes bankrupt after 2026. And I would say there's about an 80% probability the, the company doesn't go bankrupt at all. And so we're looking very good here with Fubo at this point in time. Things are moving in the right direction. It's very exciting. I can tell you that because... If you go back a year ago, it was a lot more shaky when they had those huge losses. Go back two years ago, whoo, the, look at the losses two, three years ago. Fubo was taken at that time. It was bad, bad, right? Now, here's the deal. The next two months for this company, we should see advertising revenues fly to the moon. You've got crazy political ad spend going on right now and will continue over the next few months. 
College football season starts at the end of August, and then NFL season starts at the beginning of September. That's always a huge boost up for Fubo. You see the Google trends go crazy for the company. We should see advertising revenue and subscriber numbers fly for this company. We should also see the losses trend continue to trend down on a year-over-year -year basis substantially over the next several quarters. And I think we're looking at a profitable quarter at some point in 2025. It could be as early as the second quarter of 2025 in terms of profitability, in my personal opinion now at this point in time. As far as the plans go, where they're pricing at, they're, they always do a free trial at first to get people kind of in the door. And then $79 a month for that package. They do $89 for that package. And then the big dog package, which I have, which is phenomenal. It covers all your channels. You can watch four games on, on one screen at the same time. That's $99 a month. So yeah, I think we're looking at pretty good overall. Now, there's the lawsuit situation, right? Disney and Fubo and, and, and Fox, right, class in New York court as venue sports antitrust lawsuit be, goes before judge. Lawyers butted heads Tuesday in a key hearing in the antitrust lawsuit Fubo filed against Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery, a case with broad implications on the pay TV business. The parties meet at U.S. District Court in Lower Manhattan after Fubo's request for a preliminary injunction. If granted a high bar to clear realistically, which is important, the injunction would delay the planned launch of Venue Sports, the streaming sports joint venture, which uh, was, was announced in February and immediately prompted the shift, or excuse me, the suit by Fubo, which maintained it would be it would cause irreparable harm, supposedly, to Fubo, right? Fubo's David Gandler is set to take the stand later in the day, fresh off the company's strong second quarter earnings report. So, no, my opinion on this has always been this is nothing but upside. This lawsuit is nothing but upside for Fubo. If they can block this service from coming out, huge win for Fubo. Additionally, the fact that Fubo is putting so much attention on Fox, on ESPN, on uh, you know Warner Brothers here, this sets Fubo up in a good situation for future negotiations. Because let's say these companies try to charge some sort of crazy rates to Fubo, Fubo is going to then take this to the politicians. They're going to take this back to the courts and say, look at what they're doing. They're, they have monopoly practices. They're buying out these sports rights, which should be a right of everybody to have access to be able to watch these, right? And they're charging us some crazy fees that we can't pay. So my, my bottom line in regards to this, across the board, it's a good situation, right? Now, some people get freaked out with David Gandler kind of playing victim in this situation, right? They get scared. They're like, ah, he's playing victim. This is, a, this is scary and those sorts of things. Listen, man, you, Fubo, they have to play victim here. They, they don't want to look strong. They want to look very weak to the courts. They want to look like it's a David and Goliath situation, which it honestly kind of is. And these guys are trying to crush us. So they have no competition. And then they're just going to go up like crazy on rates. And you're going to have to pay crazy amounts of money if you want to watch any of these different sports packages, right? And I'll put it to you kind of like this. Remember back in 2015, uh, rapper 50 Cent, he said he's broke after losing a lawsuit. That's kind of like this situation, right? You know, people looked at 50 and they're like, wait, you sold vitamin water to... Coca-Cola for like 400 mil, you sold all those records, you're in movies, like, how do you go broke? Like, what, what, what? You know, you got to kind of play the game a little bit, man. You got to play the game a little bit. So they're playing the game. Now, if you look here, revenue was up 25% year over year. That doesn't look like a position of uh, weakness, okay? Uh, but that's just between you and me. Adjusted EBITDA, $30 million negative in the same quarter last year, down to negative $11 million. Free cash flow was negative $75 million in the same quarter last year, down to $35 million negative. That's a huge improvement, right? Imagine where this could be a year from now. If you look at North American numbers, year over year growth at this point last year was 23.3%, now 24.2% on a year over year basis, which means an acceleration. That's phenomenal. Look at ARPU, average revenue per user went from 81 bucks to 85 bucks. Good as well, very good, right? Now, this might be the most important thing. I don't know why Fubo doesn't break out their gross profit the way they should. I'm like, come on Fubo, like you should, I should really break out this gross profit because this is so important to the company, right? Keep in mind, Fubo for the longest time was a gross loss company, meaning almost every single company out there always has gross profit, meaning, you know, after their initial expenses, they, they're making money, right? Fubo is one of the few companies that would have a gross loss. They flipped that, starting about a year, year and a half ago or so, over to gross profit, okay? And now they're expanding that gross profit in a substantial way. Look at where gross profit was at this time last year. Now, how they used to measure gross profit was they'd take their revenues and minus subscriber-related expenses in broad 
broadcasting and transmission. So if you had a broadcasting and transmission that was about 288 mil in the same quarter last year, right? And they had 312 mil of revenue. So if my math serves me correct, that's a gross profit of about $24 million, right? Well, they just did $390 million of revenue, and if you add up these numbers here, it's about $341 million in uh, these expenses here, which puts the gross profit at about $49 million, which is about a 2x on a year-over-year -year basis there, right? That's phenomenal. This is what we talk about when we talk about things are moving in the right direction in regards to Fubo. It's pretty... You know, the, the risk reward here is pretty darn compelling. So my guess in regards to what happens with Fubo's stock price here is I think over this next 12 months, we'll see what happens with this lawsuit situation. That's going to cause a lot of volatility in the stock in the short term, positive or negative. I think if I had to say there's a lot more ups, upside potential with the stock price in regards to lawsuit situation than downside, because I think people have already kind of priced in like worst case scenario here. My guess is over the next 12 months, Fubo does an honest, and the stock goes from like the $1 range where it's at right now to like the $3 range. And, you know, it just eliminates all bankruptcy possibility. We're moving in that direction. We're not quite there yet, but we're moving there, right? Give it another quarter or two, bring down these losses, and I think we'll be there in regards to this, right? By the way, in regards to Honest, just today, they got upgraded uh, by Northland Securities. They, they got an outperform rating slapped on them. And basically, they're saying the stock's about to go from $3 to $6. Um, usually, there's a 12-month price target, so they believe the stock's going to be $6 at this time next year, which probably is right, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's like $10 plus, to be quite honest. Now, in regards to Honest, they're also reporting earnings on August 8th, so that's on this coming Thursday. I would say there's like a 90% probability I'm going to do a Twitch live stream on Thursday, and the reason being is Honest is reporting and Elf is reporting. So given that it's Elf and Honest, I'm like, I'm probably going to record. I also, I don't know, I just have a feeling like it's going to be a crazy day in the market. Like, I don't have anything justified to say why it's going to be a crazy day in the market. It's just, I think if you've been in the market 15 years, you just get like feelings. And I just feel like Thursday might be a little wild of a day. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But uh, obviously, there's like a 90% 90, 90 probability I'll do a live stream on Twitch on that particular day. Okay. And by the way, if you don't know my Twitch channel, Jeremy makes money. Now, Celsius. So... Earnings come out this morning. I believe the stock initially, when the earnings first hit, stock started going up. It was like people are feeling good. Okay, we're moving back up. And then the stock just sold off throughout the trading day, right? People are looking at this one like, come on. Like, what's it going to take to go up here? So I looked over their numbers, and here's what I found. Okay, revenue up 23% year over year, 23% North America, 30% up international. Gross margin went up to 52%. That's up 320 basis points year over year, which is a fancy way of saying 3.2 percentage points. Net income was up 55% year over year for the company. Diluted EPS up 65%. I mean, these numbers are, are pretty dang impressive. Their cash and cash equivalents went to $903 million now for Celsius. So they're sitting on a big old cash pile, right? And check out this income statement for the company. Revenue 401 mil versus 325 in the same quarter last year, right? Gross profit went to $209 million versus $158 million in the same quarter last year. General administrative expenses was up about $20 million roughly year over year, which if you're growing your revenue by $76 million, you should have your G&A go up a decent amount, right? Especially if you're expanding international. Income from operations went to 94 mil from 64 mil. Interest income was up to 10 mil from 5.5 mil. So total other income was up to 10.3 million. So net income before income tax is $104 million. Net income on the company was just a tad under $80 million. And that's from $51 million in the same quarter last year. Keep in mind, this company still isn't that focused on profitability. They're more focused on volume, right? They're more focused on revenue at this point in time. Now, additionally, they announced they're planning to launch in Australia, New Zealand, and France this year. So, yeah, now Australia, New Zealand, decent markets. I think France could be a, a much bigger market for the company overall there, right? Now, I was kind of looking for the sentiment from kind of the retail crowd. So I like to look at like something like Seeking Alpha and see what they're talking about. This guy, I'm assuming these are these are two uh, Celsius shareholders here. This guy says, um, all that good news for nothing, not a zilch, as shares continue to be punished for exceeding expectations. And then this guy responded, they delivered four straight quarters at 90% plus year-over-year -year revenue growth. Then, the, then that growth collapsed to 36% growth last quarter when they missed their revenue estimate, making it the lowest growth quarter, quarter ever. Now they just barely beat revenue estimates, showing year-over-year -year revenue growth of just 23%, uh, making it their new lowest target growth quarter ever. 
uh, or at least in recent times, right? I've been long the stock from $49 to $90 and back down to $40, but I must admit that the organic growth story is fading rapidly, right? And that's one way to look at it. There's certainly one way to look at it is like, oh man, the growth was 90%. Now we're down to 23%. Maybe we're on the, you know, next thing you know, it's going to be 18%, then 15%. Then where do we bottom out at? 10%, 12%, 15% growth, right? Something like that. And so people start kind of running to that. And that's certainly one way to look at it. But you got to understand, there's more at play than just revenue growth. There's also profit growth. There's also margin growth, right? Profit growth and margin growth are looking very good for this company. There's also what happened in the valuation of the company. And that leads us to this, which is very important, right? So one of the things we have on 1000xstocks.com that almost no other service has that they should have is we put out a two-year forward P. And the way you're able to do this, essentially, is analysts are always going to usually have analyst estimates for the year you're in, but usually they're also going to have estimates for next year. The majority of the analysts will have that. So you could have a two-year forward P, and a lot of people don't put it on, and I think it's one of the most important metrics you can look at because it gives you a more reality vision of is the company really overvalued or undervalued, especially for growth stocks, right? Because growth stocks, they're growing so rapidly that the two-year forward P can be so much different than the forward P, which can be so much different than the trailing 12-month P. That's why I put them all on 1,000X. These are the sorts of things I'm doing that's making 1,000X a lot more valuable of a service than anything else in the marketplace. Because these other services are not designed by people that are actually doing this, that are actually long-term investors in the market, or actually have millions of dollars in the market. They're designed by, you know, computer people, right? I got the computer people that make the stuff happen, right? The software engineers. But the bottom line is I like design everything. And I'm like, this is why this has to be like this because you get a better justification of where the company's actually going. It's so important for growth investing. If it's Coca-Cola, you could just look at the trailing to a month P and the Ford P and they're probably gonna be roughly the same. So it's no big deal, right? Or the Ford P and the two-year Ford P. But I'm telling you for growth stocks, this is so valuable. Now, here's a deal, okay? If, if Celsius is at a two-year Ford P at 25 roughly, right? This is no longer an expensive stock. If the company can grow double digits revenue and double digits per year on net income and you're trading with something with a 20 in front of you, you're not expensive. No longer are you expensive stock, right? And that's a part people got to understand in regards to Celsius stock. Now, if I look at Celsius versus Monster and Coca-Cola, right? And this is another super valuable thing we have on 1000X that no one else is doing, right? You can compare three different companies. I want to compare Celsius versus Monster versus Coca-Cola, right? And what we're going to find is, sure, the forward P of Celsius looks way higher than Monster, looks way higher than Coca-Cola, but then look at the two-year forward P. Oh, it doesn't look so rich anymore, 25 roughly, 24, 21. And remember, Celsius is going to likely, high probability, outgrow Monster and Coca-Cola significantly over the next 5, 10 years, right? And so when you look at it from that standpoint, you start looking at Celsius and you're like, this stock is not very expensive, right? And this is what has me very close to starting a position in Celsius, a stock that if you if we went back six months ago or a year ago even, I, I never would have thought I would even entertain a possibility of buying this stock. Even you know three months ago, oh heck no. And now with how substantially the stock has dropped and the results are still putting up, now I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is this is actually looking really darn attractive. And I haven't owned an energy drink company since I owned Monster back in the day. It's been a long time. It's been, it's been like over a decade since I owned Monster, right? That's how long it's been. It's a long time ago. So, at least in terms of it was a big position for me back in the day, right? I took this picture at Target here recently, and I, I've been keeping an eye on Celsius as it's been dropped in the past several weeks, right? And not just from the stock price perspective and looking at the fundamentals, but I've been doing like store walks and whatnot, going to different stores, Costco, Sam's Club, Target, other Walmart, different stores, trying to see Celsius's products, right? And Target's one, I can tell you, it sells through, man. It's like the shelves will be packed, and then you go back two, three, four days later, and all of a sudden there's outs all over the place, right? Now they're doing some deals right now, three for six, they got deals going on. Red Bull has some deals going on as well, which people are worried about. Does this hurt margins? Certain things like that, right? Sometimes the manufacturer will take the margin hit on this. Sometimes 
the retailer will take the margin hit. I, and I don't know what it is in this situation. Maybe Celsius has taken the, the hit. Maybe Target. I don't know. You know, it, it really depends on many various factors, right? It might be Celsius taking the hit here. But also, a lot of people like to buy Celsius in big packs. So these are like big packs of Celsius. They sell for 22 bucks, And man, they hit the shelves and they put like two or three on the shelves and then they're gone, man. Celsius, Celsius, Celsius. So this is a little food for thought here. It sells through really well. I mean, I think the only thing that sells better, in my opinion at least, at least what it seems like is Monster. But I don't even know if Monster, I would say Celsius singles sell better than Monster singles. And I, actually, these packs might be selling better as well. So this is some food for thought, folks. Um, Celsius is looking pretty darn attractive. And I might start a position very soon. Don't be surprised at all. So it's been a while since I owned a, a, an energy drink company, man. But I, I'm getting real close in regards to this one. No, Palantir. So where do we go from here with Palantir? You know, stock 26.59 here today, up 10%, right? So here's a deal with Palantir. We're in a little bit of a weird spot because the growth just accelerated to 27% year over year. But you look at the guidance and the guidance is under 27%, right? Now, that's what we have to go off of for the next three months, right? Now, there's a potential Palantir sandbag and they're playing the game of Wall Street, which they still took revenue guide up, right? But they didn't take it up so high that it was kind of... There is a potential out there, right, that Palantir puts out this number here and then they come in and beat that number, right? And then they guide higher again the next quarter or something like that. This is something that has to be considered, but I don't think Wall Street's really going to consider that. I think they're going to kind of look at this from a perspective of like, Great growth last quarter, but your growth rate is going to slow down. And then where does it go from there, right? And so that puts Palantir a little bit in no man's land right now, which is why I think this stock will probably stay in the $25 to $28 range for a while. Unless, unless we get some sort of fundamental big change here. And when I say fundamental big change, if Palantir does, I think, one of three things. One is if we hear about S&P 500 inclusion before next earnings, to the moon. We're, we're, we're going 30 plus, okay? If that happens, boom, it, uh, all bets are off. If there's some sort of situation where they sign some sort of massive commercial customer to a massive deal, and then they announce that deal, and I'm talking like a big name brand company, and you know it's it, everybody's reporting on it to a huge contract, like somebody that... Everybody's just like, this is legendary, man. Like, they got to deal with this company. Boom. That gets us out of the 25 to 28 range. And next thing you know, we're pushing 30 plus, right? And the third potential here is if a major Wall Street investment bank comes out and does some sort of huge upgrade on Palantir. You know, I'm talking about a JP Morgan, a Goldman Sachs, one of the big dogs, the big, big dogs. If they come out and do some sort of coverage upgrade, big price target on this stock and then go on CNBC and talk about it and whatnot. Because that would just take another level of like big money behind it, right? And let's say they also, they don't just back it with like, oh, we think the stock's going to $33 price target or, you know, $38 price target. But they back it with what their EPS estimate is, let's say for 2025. Like, oh, we think they're going to earn, you know, uh, 50 cents in 2025 or 75 cents, like way ahead of where Wall Street's at. That would be the type of thing where it's like, okay, you get the big excitement in regards to some big price target, but then, and from a big institution, but then on top of that, you get like some sort of crazy EPS bump there, and people start thinking about, oh, maybe Palantir's cheap, it's not expensive. That would get us to like a 30 plus number. So if either of those three situations happen, I think we go 30 plus. If those th any of those three situations don't happen, I think we're kind of in no man's, land, right in, uh, no man's land and we'll probably stay in the 25 to 28 range. And we'll kind of just kind of gyrate between there. So that's my personal opinion on kind of what's going on with Palantir. And uh, I love being a Palantir shareholder, guys. Remember I told you uh, at the beginning of this video, make sure you guys grab that free little workshop I put together for you guys. Pin comment down there. Make sure you get access to that. Seven things to do when stocks are crashing. It's a good training for you. It's absolutely free to, ac uh, to access that. All right, guys, much love and have a great day.